Hey everyone and welcome to the channel. My name is GWFM and here I'm going to be talking about um, the, my beloved Leeds United and the state that we are in. Uh, it's a sorry, a sorry state of affairs when we're talking about yet another sacking in the amount of time that it's been since the last sacking and of course all the sackings previously. It's just, it just seems to be at least once a season, the one-off last season which was Monk, which wasn't technically a full year. But... It's one of them, and it's it, you can see it coming. I'd be very interested to see what your thoughts are on what's happening at Leeds as well uh, before I get into this whole chat, well, whole rant, rather. But before we go into anything, I just want to give a little bit about the background of my following of Leeds. I am 33 years old, and I started following when I was about six, so back in, like, 90, 90 91 sort of time, mainly because of my dad. And, yes, we were winning at the time. I'll get onto why that's relevant later. Um, but yes, it's it's a case of I followed him when it was like uh, you know Batty and Speed, um, you know Chris Fairclough, Chris White, etc. I just remember all those sort of players, Luke Kitchen goal, um, Matt Beanie as the backup. I remember all of them, um, and of course Lee Chapman and Rod Wallace, etc. And from then on, all the players in between, you know, go, moving on to your Robert Mullenhaar, as we were talking about the other day. And um, I was, to, you know, whatever, to cut that out. And moving on to like, Robert Molinar and Lucas Radaby sort of partnerships and Gunnar Haller. And all the way, all the way through, all the way, and then we got relegated, of course, in 2004. And, yeah, obviously we had the dark days under Blackwell. We, you know, just trying to survive with players that, that, that basically, I suppose a lot of people wouldn't have heard of at the time. And moving on to... Obviously, League One with Dennis Wise uh, and his wobbly eyes. And, yeah, it's been painful. And we eventually got back under Grayson. And, of course, as you're all aware, we're where we are now, where we've, we're still waiting to, you know, patiently to get back into the Premier League where we feel that we belong. Like, it's not, a de it's not um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a given that, you know, we should be in the Premier League just because we are Leeds United. You've got to work for it. You've got to work hard for it. And... Something goes amiss every season, it seems. And we've had some worse seasons than what we have recently. But this one has been so up and down, up and down. Uh, and we're going to get on to exactly what's happened with um, Christiansen himself. My thoughts on Christiansen going was inevitable, wasn't it? I mean, I've written a lot down here. It started off so well. And we were dominating. And, you know, everyone was worshipping. Worship there was um, making images on Facebook posts where they replaced Jesus' face with Christiansen's face on. And everyone was loving it. And, you know, we were loving it, loving it, loving it, and loving it like this. Uh, and we did really, really like it. And we did, we did think it was wicked, 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 or whatever that fucking song is. But, yeah, after that, it's like we had a lot of foreign players, which we still do, of course. Um, and they didn't understand. Like, people always say, oh, you don't understand champ the championship. And people might say, well, why does that matter? And it's because of games like Millwall. Where all they want to do is kick the crap out of you. They want to scare you. The fans will be threatening the families and stuff in the stands. Right? And that set the stall out for all the other teams to know how to play against us. Right? Saw how terrible we played in that game. We were shocking. And then other teams were fed off that. And yet we won this next game. Albeit it was a draw and beat penalties it were Burnley. And that was a great victory because it was against Burnley where Wood and, Chris, uh, and Charlie Taylor went. But... I, and, yeah, of course, we'll beat Ipswich as well. But then after that, we went on that horrendous run where we lost eight games in a row. We didn't draw some in between. We lost eight in a row. And anyone else, like, over the last... Any other chairman, sorry, in the last 13 years or whatever, it would have gone. It would have gone. And I was so surprised that it kept him on. In a way, you want stability. You, everyone wants stability. But the results have to be there to be stable. You can't expect to lose eight games in a row and to, to still be in a job, I'm sorry. But the way I saw it is we won at Borough. For me, that was about proving to Monk he made the wrong decision, more than anything. You know, because we lost his very next game against Wolves. I mean, albeit it was Wolves and Wolves, for me, I've said from day one they will piss it, and they've proven me right so far. Um, and then after that, we won five out of the next six games. You're thinking, well, maybe we were right to keep him. Maybe stability is key. And then he goes and loses, like, seven games or something, again in a row. You know, we haven't won... 
since Boxing Day, and that included the humbling defeat to Newport County, where the start of everything just seemed to go to shit. You just knew as soon as Saez got sent off for spitting, which I totally don't condone at all, and it's a it's a rightful um, suspension. People done obviously worse things, you know, like for instance, picking one out of the out of the air, chuffing Luis Suarez, biting people, and. We've missed him without a question, and I always knew it was going to be hard from that point on. But then, final five games, we've got four players recorded, and it's just in like one one per game, obviously minus the one where we didn't. But it just shows, I don't know what that meant, because halfway through that sequence of red cards, I remember Christensen saying, it will not happen again, because I'm basically going to balk him without that. We all know he wouldn't balk him. He wouldn't say boo to a goose, would he? He's... It just don't, it just go, well, I think you shouldn't get sent off or something like that. It, it say something obvious, like, you know, James Milner or Michael Owen. That's the one I'm looking for. James Milner is the boring one. Coincided with that, it, what, what coincided with that, with obviously, obviously the red cards, is our final two home games of the season. And we conceded eight goals in two games at home. It's just not good enough. I mean, it's just it's just devastating. And one of them, uh, it was against two rivals, basically. Mill, regardless of what people think, they are rivals, just for the fan bases alone. Millwall, they, they, obviously, we went out of 10 men. We got back to 3-2 in front and we're buzzing his tits off and he got it completely wrong. He took off both Roof and the Saga, who were running them ragged. And we sat up, you know, was, um, set up shop and sat back and inevitably we conceded. So yeah, nice one twice as well, by the way. So four three loss, and you think, well, at least we had the comeback, and we thought maybe you can g them up. Then we went to Hull, and we we're struggling down bottom end at table. Yes, I've got Nigel Atkins as manager now instead of that other gimp that were there, that Russian dude that that were a flop at the at the Euros. But it doesn't matter, does it? Because they're still bottom of the table for a reason, and they outplayed us. And if it weren't for Viedveld, who's had his own critics. We'd have lost that game 4 5 nil for me, the amount of chances they had. Clear-cut chances as well. And then, of course, the Cardiff game, which was absolutely appalling. 3 nil down at half-time. We had a couple of chances, didn't we, at 1 nil down, where Lusogli hit the post and hit the bar. And then um, Alyoski had all the goal to aim for, um, like over here, this sort of direction up there, um, is where the keeper was. Sorry, that's where he hit it. But over that way, all the goal to aim for, because it was on his right foot. Granted, he mishit it and end up saving it. But that could have made it a different game and who knows, we might have been talking about him. Well, no, maybe probably wouldn't be even having this conversation. Uh, not that it's a conversation. I'm moving on to my next page because there's a few pages. But essentially, that's why he's gone. He couldn't change games. He didn't had no plan B, it seemed. Because oh, that's another thing. In that game against Cardiff, we were starting to get back into it. Fortuitously, of course, thanks to Bamba scoring no goal because he felt sorry for us. And... I don't know. The soccer was causing problems, and they couldn't. They could not deal with him. So what's he do? He takes him off. Roof had been completely ineffectual all game, and he takes off the soccer was causing ha like havoc, and he takes him off. Brings off Sacco. Brings on Sacco. Might as well taking him off because he, Sacco for without his pace, he just offers nothing, and it's a shame because I, I had high hopes for Sacco when he first started. He could take people on. And he just didn't seem. He seemed to be that player when he comes on. But moving on to like the recruitment side, which I know a lot of it is at Orton, and he gets a hell of a lot of flack, especially at this moment in time. Everyone's saying, well, Christensen's gone, why not Orton? Why aren't he going? And in a way, I kind of agree, but is it a case of that the signings are decent and he just couldn't motivate him, couldn't Christensen, or is it a case of that the signings are going to be crap? Because if that's the case, then whoever comes in, we're fucked, basically. Right? So you've got... I've, I've written a lot on here. But basically, he's brought in a couple of good players in, like the likes of Saez and Alioski, to some extent, because Alioski is hit and miss. If you go like this, like, I don't know, this is a pen. If you go like this, it goes down. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't take much. You can blow on him and he go over. Right? But when he's on the ball and, he, and he's allowed to play, he plays very well and he can play, provide some decent crosses in and he's got a few assists, scored a few goals, so you can't fault him for, on that regard. But it, like I say, all you have to do is just literally lean into him slightly and he'll go over like a sack of shit. Um, but like on the other side of things, everything else has been absolutely doctored. And my biggest worry, I mean, I don't know how accurate it is because it is based on the game. I, my channel mainly is Football Manager. Right? And Leeds United, I played a save with them, you know, 
and they've got all the wages on, and it's supposed to be well researched. And I don't know how accurate it is, but and Vernon and Eater is on apparently twenty five grand a week, which is the highest of the entire squad, and hardly plays, and he's getting paid that amount of money for what? For for getting splinters in his ass, you know, at best because he doesn't even make the bench sometimes. So what the what the what the actual piss is basically what I'm saying. He. You know, he's brought in other players like Lasaga, who, you know, he missed his child's birth and everyone was buzzing and said, oh, he's fucking awesome. He's fucking a hero. He's actually sacked off his fucking child's birth to play for us. Who in the right mind would go to work and do that, right? And then all of a sudden he has a few bad games and everyone turns on him. And it's like, you got to think, would you try if everyone were giving you flack after what you'd sacrificed? And... I don't know, I kind of sympathise with the saga, but he was shit at the same time. But is that because he's shit, or is it because of the service, or was it purely the fact that he wasn't trying that hard, or was it? Because I remember Chris Wood being absolutely shocking at one point, which brings me on to, we saw Chris Wood, and he didn't replace him with anyone really, and leads people to believe that they basically bought the ground back with the Wood money. Um, I don't know how true that is, slash Charlie Taylor money. And it's just like, I don't know. He's brought, tried to bring players in, yes, on the cheap, but you can't, you can't do what Wolves are doing, unfortunately. Which I know they are doing, it and you're saying, well, yeah, you can because they're clearly doing it. All right, point taken. But they've got shitloads of money. They've brought in a high-profile manager, someone to be a high-profile agent. Because there's no way in a million years you'd be able to sign someone like Ruben Neves, who I expected him to leave someone like Porto and go to like a Juventus or a Bayern. That's the sort of caliber, sort of player he is. He's not a chuffing uh, championship player. I'm trying to think of anyone else we signed for defence. That's right, because we didn't. We signed Cam Cameron Borthwick Jackson, and he hardly featured, so he must have been absolutely dog turd. Um, he had to be. I mean, we were warned by the Wolves fans from the season before. Pennington, he's been useless. Shaughnessy, or Shagnasty, as I like to call him, started off brightly, earned his contracts, and then since then, hardly featured, and when he has, he's been absolutely turd. Absolute tripe. Um... But yeah, I mentioned Vernon and Ite don't get a game, so I can't even judge him. Click, they brought him for one and a half million. Polish international. Poland, I believe, last I checked, are higher than England in the world rankings. Yet he can't get a game, in a, like starting in the Poland side, can't get a game for Leeds in the championship. Yes, I know he had that howler against Cardiff the first time we played him. But is it really that bad? The one, the one that is a bit you don't know yet, and he works hard as Ekuban. And I was gutted that he's been injured twice, but if that's the case, if he's just going to be a Darren Anderton, there's no point in being at the club, in my opinion. And don't forget, all of these players are on four-year deals, or there or thereabouts, because of the five-year plan, in my opinion. That's why they signed them all on contracts as well. All the existing players, like your, your Janssen and Union OK, etc., all the others, you know, they've all signed long-term contracts because it was part of this plan. Now, new manager comes in, he's going to be stuck with all these players. Unless I can somehow sell them, which if they're playing shit, is anyone going to want them? The only players I can see being sold, Janssen and, and Saiz, maybe Alioski. The one thing I think we've lacked for most of this season has been a leader, and who do we get rid of? A leader in Liam Bridcup, um, putting a man, man of the match performance against us for Forest at home. And then we move on to the under-23s. <laughs> Must be the largest squad you've ever seen. We've, I think we we got up to the 738th signing in the January transfer window, just after, wasn't it, that young lad from Forest Green Rovers. Now, all of them seem to be coming with high regards, like, they're all shit hot, and, yeah, we should be looking forward to seeing them eventually. Me, personally, I don't think we will see most of them. I think the one or two we do see, they'll end up getting sold to make a profit. I think that's why they'll be brought in. It's a business at the end of the day. We'll pick them up for the next note. We'll sell them to someone like an Everton for about four million quid or whatever. And then we'll never, it, they'll move on to England and whatever, playing for the national side, you know, like the rest of them that seem to do that. An interesting thing about the under 23s is um, Owen Stokes left, the Irish young lad, about 21, 22 years old, something like that. And there's a quote, I don't know if it's true, but apparently someone who knows him, I saw it on Twitter, and it said, basically said, Brexit means Brexit. So what that means to me is they're trying to get in all the foreign players before Brexit sets in, so there's all the new rules, because the players that are already here will not be affected. It'll be the ones that you get from beyond that point, if that makes sense. Of the players that Arthur has actually brought in, for sure, on the few games that I've seen, it looks decent, it seems to put a shift in, tries hard, 
but he hasn't really improved anything in my opinion so far. Um, De Bock has looked decent, but we've still conceded eight goals while he's been playing, so that's kind of a worry when he's a defender. Them two and Roberts, who's yet to play, you know, has just signed, you know, like the plans and everything. They said, oh, they're looking forward to what the, the fans are, what the um, chairman is wanting to do and what the manager wants to do. Manager's not here anymore. So what, they must be thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? What, what the fuck have I done? Because it's not loan ease, the, the permanent signings. You know, but that's another thing that, you know, with regards to Roberts, because at the end of the day, it's hard that it's behind it, it seems. But the Leeds fans are crying out for us to, to buy a striker. We get a striker, and he's slated instantly. That's just Leeds all over. If he didn't score in his first two games, that's it. He's the worst striker in the history of the club. Um, and he'll end up probably performing like Billy Painter. So, or, or Luke Moore, if you remember him. Oh, not Luke Moore, Ian Moore, if you remember him. Um, but, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it's it's dire though because that's that's the thing we we Leeds fans unfortunately sometimes we've got we've got a massive passionate following, but we expect so much, and it's like we've got to remember we're in the championship, and it, things don't work instantly. Sometimes if they, if they do, it's because they're something special like Samuel Saiz, what clicks instantly because he's something different. He's different gravy, right? But everyone, you're not gonna. You've got more chance of playing fog and getting every single transfer to be chuffing shit up right from the off. It's very, very. Uh, it's uh, you know, look at look at Man United. You know, they got that Memphis Depay. Spent a load of money on him. Shit, absolute dog shit. He's doing well now elsewhere, right? But you get Martial in, same sort of situation. He hits the ground running. It doesn't happen every time. And, it, you know, you can't expect it to, unless you're going to be paying out for literally the, the very top end. Look at Virgil van Dijk, 75 million. D I don't think he's had a clean sheet yet. So, yeah, Arthur's probably at fault, but I think time will, will prove whether it's, it's good business what he's done, um, based on if if any of these under-23s come good, if, um, if the actual players that are already here end up coming good under this new manager, then we'll know that it'll be the manager that's not getting the best out of him. That's how we'll know what is what. I mean, at this moment in time, we haven't hired anyone yet. We're just very strongly, extremely strongly linked with Paul Heckingbottom, which I'll get onto shortly. Before that, I just want to remind you, right, because people are kicking off at Radrizani and saying that he's just as bad as everyone else. He's not as bad as everyone else. There's no way in a million years he's as bad as everyone else, right? Think back to the, the past chairman. We had Rizdale, it were all hunky-dory until we didn't make the Champions League, which pains me because had we finished, if it had been the year after, fourth would have been good enough to finish in the Champions League and we probably wouldn't even be in this situation, you know? But it is what it is. But he persuade on the money, you know, paying out for something to do with chuffing fish tanks or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but remember something like really bad were like getting paid for, like quite an extortionate amount of money. But anyway, enough about that. Then we had, uh, when that all went shit, when all the shit hit the fan, we had Gerald Krasner and his con uh, consortium, which eventually passed us on to Kenrique Ibatius, or Ken Bates as it's otherwise known. Uh, if anyone gets that reference, please let us know in the comments below. Um, but, yes, it, it's just, he it, it took over, didn't he? And then we just had, we had Kevin Blackwell, uh, we had uh, Dennis Wise when he got, well, he got sacked in here, and we end up get we after getting to play a final. We were so close to getting back to the promised land. Lost in the final against Watford, and then fucking Jay Demerit headed. I remember that fucking corner or whatever it was. Um, and yeah, we we chuff, we chuffing. We went down the following season, and there were, I saw something the other day. They've been doing it on. You've probably seen it yourself if you've been watching YouTube. And it was Ben Parker on about how they didn't get paid. or They weren't getting paid or whatsoever. They didn't have a clue what was going on. And they still they got players in who didn't really give a shit about all that. And like I say, if we'd not won those first five games when we had the minus 15 points, who knows where we would have been. We could have done a chuff in Luton or whatever. You know. And we've got to be thankful, really, that we didn't go any further down. I know it took three attempts, but at least we were up there every single time. We got back to the division where we are uh, under Simon Grayson, who dropped down a division from Blackpool to us, and everyone back then were going, some of them, I bet, was even saying, who the fuck's Simon Grayson? You know, he was someone who, who was one of the part of academy, he never played for us really, but um, he was part of the academy, so that's why he had a link with us. And he did really well, and yeah, we nearly bottled it at the end, didn't we? But um, we, got, we got up, and then he was in, what were his, 
like three points off playoffs and they got sacked. Granted, yeah, we had the 6-4 against fucking Preston and the 5-3 or 5-2, I think it was, against Barnsley. And it made me laugh because we've got Neil Warnock in instead. Oh, we will not have any results like that. And we got beat 7-3 by Forrest, albeit Michael Brown scored. That was a momentous occasion. Um, but yeah, it, that just showed the state that we've been over the years. We're under Ken Bates. And then we got um, GFH. I went really high pitched there for some reason. And we, we thought we must have had the only Arabs that were skinned. I could, we couldn't believe we couldn't believe his luck when it, when we heard it all come come to fruition and they're like oh yeah nice one we've got two things we're gonna do a Man City we're gonna have loads of money no nope. quite the opposite they bit off more than what they could chew and uh, as a result we end up eventually finding his way to Massimo Cellino and we all know how that happened he did promise us a roller coaster ride we got a roller coaster ride it pissed off a lot of people it made a lot of people happy and laugh for a bit but I think even it was too big a job for him right. Which then we're now with Rajazani. Don't forget, every single one of these, well, maybe not every single one, but Ken Bates, I pretty much, pretty much remember him saying he was going to try and buy back the ground. And so did Massimo Cellino. Never happened. Uh, GFH, I think, did as well. Never happened. Rajazani has put his money where his mouth is and he's actually gone and bought the ground. Right? That's the first sign of progression. Then he's been sprucing it up, which I know a lot of people don't really give a shit about it. Why should they? It's not about that, it's about on the pitch. But it's making us more desirable for other people to come in, you know, in the future. Should it come to that? It makes us more desirable for people to come to, you know, these on the, the sweet things, the special sweets where they pay extra or whatever, to people who've actually got money, you know, people who can afford to piss away money, if you like. You know, it's probably a really good exp experience, especially if it's like a birthday present or something like that for someone who's a massive Leafs fan, you know. But it's a lot of money for some of them. Yeah, you've, you've just got to remember things like that. Everything off the field has been exceptional, except for the whole badge issue. You know, that's the one thing that I think it didn't really help. And it, for me, it was like it was trying to distract from the Christiansen thing, where he was doing poor, and it was a case of, all right, what can we do to try and take the minds off it? Oh, a new badge. And who the 50,000 people were? There must have been my new fans or older show fans. It must have been, because it... I, I've yet to see more than one person in the entire social media who actually likes that badge. And I just don't know what they were thinking. And, you know, we're, we're able to laugh at ourselves. You know, I laughed at most of them. We've got one with Craig, Craig David from Bo Selector on with Kez on his arm. But it's like that. Yeah, you can get the gist if you remember watching Bo Selector. And we had a good laugh about it. But it didn't take away from the fact that we were losing games left, right and centre once again. Um, but anyway... Moving on, we're going to say go on to the retrospective new manager, as it seems anyway. It looks like it's going to be Paul Heckingbottom from Barnsley. Now, a few things here. Right, I've got written a few things. It's what I've heard and what I've seen. And um, by all counts, he's worked wonders at Barnsley because they've got no money whatsoever. And when they were doing really well last season, they end up selling all the players in January, all the best players. Yeah, he got them up. On a shooting budget as well in the first place, and he's kept him up. So you've got to give him credit where it's due. However, the one thing that doesn't really inspire is one win in 16 games. One win, 16 games. Because um, one last thing I'm hecking bottom is I've heard on the radio that apparently he signed a new deal for with Barnes. But apparently it's a rolling contract. So that's a cheap option if I've ever seen one. Now, there's a tally, like I've got on the screen in front of me, of like all the best win ratios since Don Revy and whatever. And actually, the best person is actually Gary McAllister for a 50% win ratio. But everyone will, all, all everyone will remember about Gary McAllister is Histon. Losing to Histon with likes of Fabian Delft playing. Strachan, for me, has done basically fuck all in his managerial career. Yeah, you could argue Celtic, but I could win at Celtic. I could win everything at Celtic, pretty sure. Because anyone could win at Celtic. I need a test, one of my FM tests. I put David Hockaday in charge of Celtic. He didn't win first season, but he won the following six. That says it all, really. You know, obviously it's just a game. It's just a, a fun test that I did. But I did do it. Nonetheless, it's on my channel. You'll find it. Yeah, Grayson is another. It's a funny one because a lot of people say, like, how much he's failed at Sunderland. It's the first team he's failed at, in my opinion because he's got other teams promoted, albeit only into this level. But Sunderland, for me, poison chalice. Chalice? 
Chalice, I'm like Sean Connery. Poison Chalice. That is like David Moyes got to Man United. It, never gonna win. Never gonna. It, never gonna work. Never gonna win. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down or whatever that song is by. I forget his name. Name in the eighties. Rick Rold. Rick Astley. There we go. But he. He took the chance, bigger, bigger club, big big chance for him. It was a big opportunity for him to do something with a, a, a big size club. No disrespect to Preston, but Sunderland are probably, arguably, you'd argue bigger than us, but the, I don't think they are. Um, but people would argue otherwise, which I'll get onto that slightly later on as well. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I don't know, it, it, it's a pain in the ass really, because it might come back and it might work because he's not under Ken Bates. And it sounds like it, it'd be... You know, a relationship seen in heaven. You know, bring him, bring him back, bring him back together with the fans because everyone liked him. And for that reason, I'd say maybe, yeah, he'd probably been the first choice. At, well, after it'd be between McAllister and Grayson for me personally. Basically, I've got a tweet here um, that I've got from Noel Noel Wheeler. I've got it on the screen. Uh, you might have seen it if you're on Twitter, and it's summed up perfectly who we need. It says someone with heart, desire, passion, discipline. Strong-minded, can motivate, can motivate, organise and get the best out of the players and show the fans that he will not accept anything less than 100%. Install into the players the expectations from our club and make him say get in several times. That part I might have added on myself. Um, if you listen to Radio Leeds, you'll know what I mean. But that's that's what it is. That sums it up perfectly. Someone who's going to be able to you know, guide them in the right direction is what I, I said earlier on, on Twitter, but that's I saw that and I thought that sums it up more than what I said earlier. Um, but what you got to think is now, the fi- it's a five-year plan, which I know a lot of people dislike that, they want instant success, which you can't gamble. Look at the likes of Blackpool. Look at Bolton to some degree. I mean, not that they gambled to go up, but they, they, they've they been imploding with money and they're struggling even now. That's why they sold Gary Medine so he could play against Leeds. Um, whereas I strike didn't play. That's another story. But, you know, other teams have gone down and, you know, Portsmouth for another one that have spent a lot of money. They basically did a Leeds. Now, we were the unfortunate ones that we didn't get the parachute payments because who knows what would have happened had we got them. I'd put it this way, we wouldn't have been signing the likes of Paul Butler and, and uh, what other one? Sean Gregan, although I think he was actually a monetary value signing. <laughs> I can't remember exactly. But, um, you know, it, it's... It's, diff- it's difficult. I, I've mentioned Poison Chalice already in terms of Sunderland, but it's also for us, whoever takes over, if it is Hackerbottom, it's a Poison Chalice for him because have you seen the fixtures we've got? I've got them on a separate page. Let me get them up. So first of all, we've got Sheffield United at home. Sorry, Sheffield United away. You know, So that's going to be a tough game. I know they're not in the, in the same form as what they were early on in the season and we probably would have as best chance to beat them if, out of any of these, in my opinion. Because then after that, we've got Bristol City who are going to be up for revenge. They're up there. You know, Derby County are second, flying. They'll piss all over us, in my opinion, at Pride Park. You know, Then we've got Brentford who showed us how to, how to play football when we went to their place. Is it Ashton? No, Ashton Gates, Bristol City. I can't remember their stadium. Um, but it's... Yeah, you know, I remember I was out chuffing a bonfire night and I was chuffing out in pissing cold rain. And I was watching it on my phone and I'm like, fucking hell, man, this is dog turd, what's going on? But anyway, um, and then after that, you know, Middlesbrough, minus Gary Monk, so there's no Gary Monk factor to jeers up. And then Wolverhampton Wonders the game after that. So the next six games is nearly... Imp- you, you can't expect us to get maximum points. You'd be hopeful of maybe getting, you know, five or six points. Based on current form, so I think a change had to be make, made, and we have looks like we are doing. Um, but like I said, what we have to do is, because if he loses the first two, three games of this little run that I've just mentioned, all the fans are all going to get on his back straight away, which adds the pressure straight away, which means the fan, the players will have extra pressure, which you know you might argue they get paid a lot of money, they, they should deal with pressure, and you're not wrong, but fact of the matter is. The wolf, the the human beings, the wolf, no, no. And when that happens, you know, it's a new manager. We need to get behind him, whoever it is. Otherwise, he's just going to struggle just the same. You know, if they really understand us, they'll know how much we care and how much frustrated we get, uh, how frustrated we can get, should I say. But what I'm saying is you, you're going to have to be not, especially with this run of games, it's like the hardest start that you could ever wish for. 
based on current form and situations where people are in, in where teams are in the league. You've got to be ca- you, you've got to give him chance. And don't get me wrong, we lose all six, then yeah, he's going to be under pressure. But basically, you know, I I'm equally as frustrated as all the other fans. It, it is, and I was good to because I, I did like Christensen and I thought it'd be a good. Eventually, I, I thought it'd be good because mainly because of the Barcelona link and learning from Johan Cruyff, but and he tried to instill that and it were working. But all like I said right at the beginning, just get into us and that were it. I think what it, Gary Rowett said, if the score, that's it. If we score first, that's it. We've won. Basically, it, not in as many words, but he basically said that and it worked and that's what people have done. How many times have we come back from goals down to win? We, I don't think we have, have we? I, I, I remember we nearly did against Millwall, but again, going back onto other things. But yeah, what you got to think of though, the bigger picture is the other regimes, what were happening, because we're still in there like swimwear, seven points away from safety, not from safety, from the playoffs. It is still technically doable. I know confidence of all the fans is low and we're probably not thinking oh, yeah, as if it's not going to happen. Who knows, this guy, new manager comes in and changes his fortunes, we might be laughing. Who knows, it might be a blessing in disguise, all this. So I had a chat with a Man United fan and he we had a big argument back in, well not a big argument, but a big di- discussion about our fan bases and how big a club we are. And he was saying we are a small club. Obviously I defended us to the hilt. But... I found it hard to defend us when he was going on Twitter, which I know it's only Twitter, it's social media, but there's a reason I'm going to bring it in. And essentially, they had like 18 million, they have, at the point, they had 18 million followers as opposed to like, you know, Liverpool, probably the next biggest club in the country, 12 million. And we were, or Arsenal might have been, there were, there were not, there were a couple of million between them, but I remember Man United being the highest. And then there's us on 350,000. Now, it might still sound a lot, but we are a one city team. And. I found it bizarre that we haven't got that many kids, but I know why. It's because we're not in the Premier League and we're not challenging for honours. Because that's what kids do these days. So these days, the kids that are like teenagers, like bear in mind, like at my peak, like um, teenagerhood, where even then social media wasn't really a thing. Maybe MySpace were just kicking about. I was 16 and it was the Champions League season. All right, so lots of fans were still supporting Leeds, which are probably about around the same age as me now, following on Twitter and what have you. But the kids nowadays, they're turning 16 and they're watching the likes of Chelsea, Man City and Man United and, and Chelsea and, all, and Spurs doing really, really well and stuff. And they're just going to be supporting the teams doing well because, let's be honest, most, most people, most fans, most, not all, but most, are glory hunters, you know, and... It's a shame because I think the, the longer we stay out of this division, the less and less fans there will be because, sadly, people will die. They'll get old. So that's, I think, why a lot of people get frustrated, in my opinion, because I think, I think deep down they're scared of dying before seeing them back in the, in the top flight. But I don't know. It's just... We've got to support them through thick and thin. But, it, you know, it'd be nice just to get... If we're going back in the Premier League, I've got no doubt that our following would rise again. But while we're in this division and below, it's just a shit show, isn't it? And it's just a shame. But, yeah, it's been a, a bit of a rant. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Um, I may do more if it's if, if it's something people enjoy. I, I just felt obliged to say something after finding out the news last night about Christensen and, obviously, the in, in, inevitable news, it seems, that Heckenbottom's taking over. Um, you know, I'm saying give him a chance. I don't know what you guys think. But otherwise, you might not be interested. But I do do, as mentioned, football manager stuff on my channel. I did a save with Leeds when the game first came out. Well, the beta part of it where it officially came out. It might be worth checking out. Who knows? You might just might be able to read into the attributes of some of the players. You know, the, it's out of 20 is the score for how good they are. Like passing, vision, etc. Tackling. Um, it might be of interest. Some of you might already follow us or whatever. So, yeah, if you have checked this out, thank you very much for watching. Um if I'm going to do some more, if I get enough like support, like I said, and I do do more, it might be worth subscribing. It gives a bit of a leg up on the subscriber chain. It help us uh, uh, grow. And obviously, leave a comment below. Leave your thoughts below. If you know, if you've got any whatsoever, you know, please go ahead because it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting back end of the season. Let's just say that, and let alone the next four years. So let us know what you think in the comments. But until next time. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.